Len, Len y um, I want to read, read some of the credits because the list goes on and on, but it's just that uh, amazing credits like uh, Star Wars, Call of Duty, uh, World of Warcraft, and, 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 and many, many, many other things. Yeah, things. Yeah, you're finishing implementation with Outcast 2 at, at the moment. moment. Uh, yes. uh, it is so amazing to have Lenny here today. We are so uh, grateful to have you. And that's, that's one thing. But the, the other thing that I also wanted to, to share with you is when we uh, were putting together this event, um, we, we, we had no, no one, we started contacting people, and um, Lenny was one of the first people, for sure he was the first person who responded in a matter of like five minutes, and um, his willingness to help to participate, to help the students, um, is, um, I remember explaining everything, and he was like, yeah, yeah no problem, let's do it, in fact, today is... So uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, we haven't even yeah. announced <laughs> the event, event yet. And, and here we are recording it in February. Um, and um, the, the, the event, event the event we are recording it. Uh, I just wanted to, to let you know. know. I'm, I'm, uh, Lenny was my teacher back in USC 12 years ago, which is scary. Um, and I remember how um, amazing his class was and how open he was to head and share. And, and that is amazing. And, and with, with that, that um, it's, it's going to be a, a fantastic match. I've got a lot to share, and uh, again, I wanted to introduce you to It's a great video game to Bulger, Lenny Moore. Thank, thank you for being here. here. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Mark was in my uh, Composing for Video Games class at USC like 12 years ago, and uh, I seem to remember him being a good student, but uh, yeah, my my advocacy, my passions have been either as a composer of music for different kinds of media, uh, film, video games, commercials, television, uh, whatever, and uh, uh, mostly video games because that's been like probably the biggest passion. I've uh, I just love the puzzle of what video games. Uh, and video game music is about and then uh, on top of that the other the other passion is uh, a passion of contribution and giving back to the community and sort of helping to uh, train and inform the next generations of composers in media and figuring out like you know basically sharing a little bit of my experience but also just how I think about approaching scoring for media which you know it's been something that I've done for the last mm, 15 years maybe mm -hmm. yeah, yeah fantastic, fantastic. Uh, that's, uh, that is great so um, um, thanks, thanks again, again for being here, here. In the, and um, what, 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 what is the structure, structure of, of the, the class? class uh which class are you talking about like the USC class? <laughs> no, <laughs> <we did. laughs> no, but, but, but what, what we're going to do today? today? What are we, what are we oh, the structure of what we're going to do today. I don't know. I thought it would probably be conversational. Uh, you know, you can ask me whatever you think uh, is of most interest to the students. I do have stuff to show people. Um, uh, you know, I, I thought it'd be good to talk about what I call music design, which it's not quite music implementation, but it's more just the ways of thinking about how music is performed inside a video game and uh, how I like to think about it and the kind of puzzles that we run across um, when we're trying to figure out like, how do I make something that normally would be a linear kind of a musical idea, uh, how do I break it up into chunks and pieces and, uh, and sort of reconform it within a music engine and and have it play back to make it sound f fluid and um, integral to what the game experience is. All right, fantastic. fantastic. So, so um, let's, let's think about, about the, the, the real beginners here. here. And, and it's, uh, uh, let's define, so there's, there's, there's linear music, which is what, what we do for, for movies. movies. Right, maybe. Mm -hmm. and then there's yeah, it's, it's almost everything. Linear is like, if you're writing a song, it starts at the beginning and goes to the end and you figure out what you're going to do in the middle, that's linear. And so it's, it's all, all uh, or most media. So commercials, songs, televisions, album work, um, uh, film, television, all that stuff. But then we've got video games and the music reacts to the game. And that is uh, adaptive music. Mm -hmm. As it's called, as it's called, right? Yeah. And, 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 and for the music to be adaptive, we composers will have to approach it a little bit different, right? When we are composing. Yeah. 
yeah part of it is it's a bigger question mark it's 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 asking a question about what is music and what is a music experience and <clears throat> for me that music experience it, it's a little bit of an experiment it's it, as far as video games uh, are concerned uh, a lot of what I do is either in uh, you know for the beginners there's sort of two variations of music systems within video games one is what I call a vertical system where you have let's say layers of audio where you've got like like one layer that might repeat and loop and then you might have a second layer on top and then you might have some sort of a, a fader system built into the music engine that lets you hear individual layers or combinations of layers together so it's basically it's this vertical system uh, the other kind of a system would be a horizontal system where uh, it's more like if you're playing something on iTunes you know like a playlist you know where it's just like it plays the first piece and then when it's done with the first piece it goes to the next piece of music and so horizontal systems kind of work that way and then there's sort of mixed systems between the two I might have a horizontal system but each little segment in the horizontal system might have layers and vertical kinds of elements that that I can control uh, so between those two ideas that's generally how I might break apart the music but then the other puzzle when you're creating something is you're creating a piece of music and then you have to think about well how do I break this into components and what's the minimum number of components going back to the question that I posed about what is music what's the minimum number of components that make it feel like it's a piece of music it, um, and I remember that back in the, uh, obviously when you break down that, that piece, you're not going to break it down with that brass or woods strings and percussion. It's not that. It's, it's the... Yeah. Although you can. <laughs> I remember back at USC, some students yeah. would do that and you're like, yeah, you're a lazy mother. <laughs> no, I don't think I, I did. I know I did swear, but I don't know if I said that. I don't want to shatter people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the um, obviously the, you're organizing the elements in a way that, like for example, low, mid, and high intensity, that would make mm. more sense than brass looks right. Um, and so the, the question is like, how much you as a composer are in charge of creating that interactive, adaptive music um, with with middle work things like this, or yeah. you submitting the music and someone else implementing it. Yeah, so it depends on who you're working with, and I'll give a couple of examples. I know that uh, both Sony and EA um, have, depending on which, you know, because they're so big companies, Sony has like two audio uh, offices in the United States, one's in Santa Monica, one's in San Mateo, California. Uh, they also have uh, a UK, I think it's in the UK, uh, division as well so they're kind of all over the world EA also has you know a bunch of uh, audio departments across the world but for the most part uh, Sony and EA they do have audio teams where there may be you know 20 30 people that are implementing audio and uh, for some of those kinds of companies a lot of times what they're looking for are uh, composers recording artists that they find really interesting and uh, there are uh, uh, communications from them that basically say, hey, just send us a lot of stems, a lot of, break out your music into separate audio components and we'll put it together and we'll, we'll let you know if, if we need anything more, that kind of, that kind of a situation. Uh, some clients, uh, uh, it's rare that I get asked to personally implement the, on Outcast 2, I'm actually involved on the implementation. I've been involved early on in that project. Uh, on the music design and everything so it's been an awesome collaboration uh, with appeal which is the developing company and uh, yeah that's sort of the two the two camps it's either you know hey help us figure it out or uh, for the most part there's somebody implementing this stuff at the uh, game development side or on the game publishing side uh, what, what are the things, things that you think, think are important when scoring um, with your game games? Um, what's the game about would be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, what's the story? What's the game about? Um, 
what are the game mechanics? Uh, for me, like, I've, I've had a couple of different situations in my career uh, where I've had very minimal information from the client, uh, or, and some where it's about as maximal information as possible. So the minimal information might be something where they just send me a couple of screenshots Mm -hmm. uh, like a half a dozen screenshots and I think in the USD class uh, that Mark attended there was some example where I just showed you know like I had a couple of uh, JPEG images of characters you know like a white witch with a flute or something like that and uh, uh, and that's all they gave me <laughs> and so like I, I didn't get to see what gameplay looked like I just saw a few screenshots of characters and that was about it and then I had to do a whole score from that. And basically, in those situations, you just give your best guess based on your experience and your communications with your client. Um, in an example with Outcast 2, uh, I've got complete access to all the assets. And uh, partially, that's because they've brought me in early enough to be able to see how things are developing. Uh, they've also provided me with... Uh, with uh, videos of gameplay, uh, even though it's in a very early stage uh, when I was scoring this, the gameplay footage is super helpful. So it's also rare that you might see a playable demo version. It depends on when you're brought into the process. If you're brought in uh, after the you know alpha stage, uh, so there's just for the the newcomers, there's a couple of stages in game development. The alpha stage means that the game is working, it just needs polish and debugging. The beta stage means they've sort of worked out all the bugs and they are doing final testing before they release the game. And so uh, even before alpha stage has been met, I was getting videos on how things were looking in the game. And that's super helpful to see how how the character, if, you've, if your game involves a main character, uh, uh, you can kind of see how the character is moving in the space, uh, depending on what kind of assets are, are up and working. You can see how the tone of the game feels. And as a creative person, that's super helpful information. Uh, if I see we're in a forest and it's um, very fantastical looking and uh, there's little creatures running around and stuff like that that evokes certain feelings and I respond to that in the same way that I would respond when scoring a film and I'm looking at picture and the picture is dictating to me uh, what the tone of the the film experience is going to be for the audience and that helps me figure out what I got to do as a composer um, that's, that's the, the how, how many, many layers do you usually, usually or, or let's call it different, different puzzle music, music um, in the BBM games. So you've got the cinematics, then you've, you've got, got different levels. Um, what, what different, different types, types of music do you compose for a for BBM game? Uh, yeah, so there's different kinds of things. Usually there's what we call an asset list, which is a list of all the musical components that you have to deliver. And um, But even within that asset list, it's sort of somewhat incomplete because um, if you have multi-layered kinds of stuff the, the asset has one name to it and there may be like you know 20 layers on it but you know it's just got one name um, so it's you know one asset times 20 and so um, let's see let me make sure I get the question clear in my mind here um, so as far as what they provide me, uh, there's usually some sort of a, a, a Google Sheet or an Excel file that has just a list of everything they need. Uh, a lot of times, this is super important in game development, they give me the name of the file that they want me to name it. They want it named very specifically. And in other media like film and television, they don't care what you name a particular piece of audio that you send them when they're putting it into a film. Um, uh, that doesn't matter at all. But because we're dealing with programming and uh, a lot of the programming is, is doing what's, what's uh, named a call, it's calling out to grab a particular piece of audio and, uh, or it's calling out a particular game event which is triggering a specific piece of audio. A lot of times the file naming is super important. So those Excel sheets um, or Google Sheets, they, uh, 
they usually have a list of everything I have to deliver. And so it'll say, as an example, um, there might be an area that's, I'll go back to the forest area. Let's say it's a forest area and they say, hey, we want five minutes of music and uh, we want it to um, have a tension element in uh, that'll come up whenever there's a low-level skirmish. So let's say you, the forest is mostly exploration, uh, but there might be small interactions where there's little skirmishes, like you 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 get attacked by a couple of spiders or something like that. <laughs> so so in that case, uh, you know they may want a layered system. So basically, it's a general ambience for the tone of the forest, and then something adds a tension element. So it might be something as simple as two layers. Um, or it could be more complex than that. It just depends on how much interaction the, the developers really want in any given situation. You've mentioned earlier 20 layers. Oh, mm -hmm. In what scenario would you have 20 layers? <laughs> oh, uh, the reason I'm laughing is uh, Outcast to the music. I, you know, what I can say about it at this point, because we're still revealing certain things, uh, or not revealing certain things. Uh, what I can say about it is that the music system is pretty robust, and uh, and there are elements where, um, you know, I'll try and give a generalized kind of uh, uh, example. Let's say we'll stick to our little forest metaphor. Um, uh, let's say uh, the tension layer is not just one element, but three. So you've got like a basic mm -hmm. element that's like the general track that is the tone of the um, the forest, and then there's up to three levels of intensity depending on what the intense interaction might be within that forest so if it's a couple of spiders that might be level one level two might be like six creatures so they might use the number of creatures in an encounter uh, and then there's like 10 spiders or something like that and that might be level three and each of those layers adds you know more of an intense feeling to the situation and so that's that's a four layered system but now let me add something else let's say <clears throat> in that base layer um, that's just the tone of the forest let's try uh, having a solo melody so I have a flute player they play a solo melody and I tell the flute player give me like three variations where you interpret the melody differently you might improvise a little bit you might do some embellishing um, that kind of uh, situation so now I've added three more layers because I've got a bass layer and then I've got separate layers that are just my flute melody and I might be able to randomly pick one of those melody elements. Mm -hmm. So now I'm up to seven. <laughs> so so it, can, it, can, it can get big after a while, depending on how, how you treat it. And uh, how big it can get depends on uh, what kind of console you're going to create for it like if it's for a nintendo switch that's more of a stereo file and that's uh, uh there may be some limitations on how many um audio pieces you can have going on at the same time without it making the little handheld thing go a little nuts um if it's one of the newer xboxes or uh, playstation 5 or something like that um or on a pc you know, that's about as much computing power as a modern computer will have, and that'll be a little more un unlimited. Uh, so it, it, it just depends on, you know, like what you're developing for. Uh, I've had some games where it's literally like no more than two stereo audio files, and that's it. You know, but for the modern systems, um, you know, it could be like separate assets for a stereo mix and then a surround mix. You know, so now that seven layer thing that I described is now 14 audio assets and, you know, where I've got like the flute melody in surround in three different layers. I've got it in stereo and, you know, it just extrapolates from there. So, so uh, uh, let's, let's talk, talk about, about the, 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 the,
just managing all of the multiple files, files and, and, and formats. formats. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's a process. process. It's, it's, uh, it takes, takes a lot, lot, I guess. It's not yeah. just yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a. It's it's both an. It's both a modern issue and and something that's been around for a long time in various forms uh, in the past. So in the past, how would you organize if you're scoring a movie? How many how many pieces of music you had to rate? And a lot of times it would be like. You know, like if you think about it, if a movie is uh, two hours long, but there's like 80 or 90 minutes of music that you're writing for it, that might be 40 or 50 different music cues. So 40 or 50 assets that you're managing and you have to figure out, oh, you have to kind of stay organized and, you know, did I, which cues have I written, to, you know, so far? How many cues do I have left to do? How much time do I have? So a lot of it is just scheduling and managing um what you have to do with that in a video game it's similar on that front but then it's exponentially increased you know based on like that example i just gave where you've got now 14 assets for one thing with one file name um, now you have to like uh like stay on track with you got to write the piece of music you have to think about how it gets broken into chunks then you have to export out all those little chunks and then you have to name them a particular way. <laughs> then on top of that, you have to uh, figure out uh, like, how do I create some sort of a checklist? <laughs> you know, what, what do I use to, to stay organized and manage that? And that's, that's a, you know, that's a puzzle like uh, different composers use different things. So I use a couple of different methods. One is just to make a Google sheet where you sort of create a lot of columns, you know, so you have a, an asset and then across the rows, you've got like different columns and the different columns might say, is it composed? Check mark. Is it orchestrated? If you're doing a live recording, um, are the parts copied? Are they printed? You know, and you start making columns and then, um, and then you can even break it down within a Google Sheet to, um, you know, the individual assets that you have to bounce out and are those done. So that that's one way of staying organized. So I have a couple other tools that I use that are like database management tools. Do you do, but, do you have anything that you're going to show us into like a spreadsheet or something? And maybe we can put that on top of what you're explaining. It's going to make the class a little more. Yeah. So let me let me take a look here to see if. Uh, um, uh, if I have something interesting, so um, that, that you can show. For yes, sure, exactly. Artists. Yeah, um, yeah. So, are you talking audio, or are you talking more the organizational stuff? The organization. That's the thing okay. that we're talking about at the moment, and then maybe sure. later on. Got it. So let me let me just load something up really quick here. Um, all right, let's do a share screen. There you go. Okay, so. Oh. This wow. is a custom. Okay. This is a custom app called mm -hmm. QLog Manager, and literally, it is, I don't know, fifteen years old. Mm -hmm. um, and what it allows me to do, it's just using a database. And uh, there's an old software called FileMaker Pro yeah. that was like a database management software. So what this allowed me to do was, you know, this was for Watch and Motion Comics. So this is a while back, and like two thousand nine. Uh, but it was it was for a film, and I can actually break things out by film reels, mm -hmm. right? And then I can add cues, um, and then it's just got a bunch of check boxes. And the first three are the composed, scored, and mixed are fixed, but all the other ones you can just type in and put whatever you want. So I wrote, is it sequenced? Did I do a mock up? Uh, any rewrites. So I had this multiple rewrite kind of thing just to track how often am I rewriting something, uh, which is a data point to tell me like how efficient am I being as far as getting on the same page with the, with the director, mm -hmm. um, whether something's approved, orchestrated, et cetera. So did I do my clicks and prelays? Is it delivered? All that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so this is a pretty robust tool because it allows you to, to like pick individual things and zoom in on particular elements. And you can then add, um, you know, comments, 
if you want. Uh, it keeps track of what you've done, how many minutes you have to write, and it gives you sort of a running total on the project thing of uh, if you've composed everything, how many cues you have to write. And based on whenever your recording session is, it tells you how many days you have left to write all the cues you got. So it's an organizational tool. Um, honestly, I've seen- It seems like you did your own QTV. Totally. You, you, you build your own QTV with, uh, with um... A uh, FileMaker Pro. Yeah, and 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 actually, this was um, this was something that there's a um, orchestrator in Los Angeles uh, named Greg Jamrock who actually made this for David Newman, the oh, wow. composer, and uh, and then he would update it every once in a while. So I had purchased it from him uh, a bunch of years ago, and so that's that's one way of going. Um, Another uh, way to go is just using a Google Sheet, which I don't have loaded up, but you could just do a similar thing where you just set up some columns and you set your columns up in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. And then you could just put little X's on whatever you've got done. So that's an example of, you know, like one way to stay organized. You could literally just use a pad of paper <laughs> and write down, you know, everything there. Uh, I've seen some composers use a whiteboard where they just write down all the cues they got to do and they do the check marks on a whiteboard. Um, uh, some people use Trello, you know, other tools. Uh, so uh, honestly, it does not matter. There's no standard within the industry. It's, uh, it's more figuring out how do you stay organized? And I'm going to take this a step further. So uh, how do you stay organized in the DAW? <laughs> right. So, um, so I'm actually going to throw a question back at Mark here. So, so, so Mark, when you're composing, how do you stay organized? So, you know, like if you're scoring to film, uh, first off, uh, what do you use? Do you use logic or uh, Cubase? I like Cubase. Okay. So I am also a Cubase person. So we've got our Cubase contingency here. So within the DAW, how do you stay organized as far as like when you've got a hit point and you know, do you use markers? How, how do you work within your DAW? So I'm a little bit weird. I do it's markers, yes, mm -hmm. um, and uh, just adjusting those markers with tempo. And then g generally, um, sometimes it's, it's hard, and I split it in, in several projects. But generally, I do the entire movie in in one project, which is crazy. But I've got everything set up so I can so I can do it this way. It can be pro problematic when if you do the final cue and then you do the other cues because you change tempo, but. Yeah, you can figure it out basically to for that key, for every key to stay in the same place and other problems that this um, will arise that, was, that this will create is that you can't attach any level in your template the level has to stay the same and basically you are adjusting volumes and levels and balancing with uh with, with expression right. basically right um, but, but but i like that as well because i can move fast if i uh, to reuse material i Sure. You can always reuse material, uh, opening, and closing projects, and I've got my samples loaded in a, in a separate farm. Or it's just one computer actually at the, at this point. Um, it's it's a small farm, but it's a farm. It is a small farm. <laughs> yes, it used to be a bigger farm, but I like smaller farms now. Um, yeah, and trying to move everything right. to just one computer, but at the moment it's one and and be pro. Um, that would allow me to open and close projects fast, but I still prefer working in one big. That, that's me. That's me. Right. That's inside. That's it. That's how I get organized inside QAs. Sure. And so I, I organize things a couple of different ways. So, um, uh, so uh, within QBase, I'll use markers and, and anybody that's working strictly in the DAW, because I'm a little bit unusual compared to a lot of modern composers. Uh, if if you're working within the DAW, there's a lot of tools, whether it's Logic or QBase or Reaper or you know digital performer any sort of DAW, even pro tools um a lot of them have a marker system so you can actually put in <clears throat> and and you can usually lock those markers to time code so if you're talking scoring for film or any other sort of linear media uh, you can kind of put in your hit points you can put in like um indicators in the markers like uh you know in bar 12 is when the main theme kicks in, you know, so you can just make notes to yourself as you go. And Logic also has a component where you, there's global notes and then there's notes per individual track. 
And I think Pro Tools has like a notes within each track as well. Um, it's hard to read, but Pro Tools has something like that. But, you know, like I know in Logic, it's like if you select a track and you're looking at your little notes on the side, um, uh, it'll, it'll show you individual notes you've written for a particular track. Like I need to redo this ho French horn part. It doesn't sound good or whatever. And then there's global notes that are sort of generalized notes that you can give to yourself. So it's a way for you to stay organized. Some people use markers to, to jot in their chord progressions, you know, where they can kind of, you know, keep track that way. I've done that. I've done that. And, uh, and then I discovered that Cubase has a thing for your course progression that that's uh you can have a separate track for course progression if it's something complex that you want to remember yeah um because you know like for me the the difficult thing is how to stay organized within the DAW. if you're creating if your creative process as a composer is within the DAW, how do you stay organized how do you know when you write a little harp accompaniment and then you add a piano accompaniment what scale did you use and and you know and what did you actually play and do you remember it? Because if you do a scalar thing in the piano and then a scalar thing in the harp, and you just start layering things, eventually there's going to be a collision where you get some dissonances, like half steps, because you forgot where you were in the scale on the harp part and when you add the piano part. It's a really that common is, problem. That is super important, not because you are more or less skilled. It's because sometimes if you don't use these tools that they offer, then your, your music is going to be limited by the amount of things that you see in the screen, uh, depending on how you've organized it, right? Yeah, um, and also the part of this is, you know, for me, uh, composition is, um, and I don't know if you remember this from the class, but you know, my definition is uh, composing is organized sound over time. So it's the organized part. That's super important as far as how do you, uh, stay on top of everything and how do you control what you're expressing emotionally and also um, composers in general kind of overwrite mm -hmm. kind of always overdo it uh, and there's one of the faults of DAW systems is you can just layer a bunch of stuff and eventually it'll kind of mush together and it'll sound okay mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's not very rigorous composition. It's not really controlling what you're saying. We are insecure creatures, and sometimes we hide those insecurities behind complex music. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we tend to overwrite all the time. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it's okay to write complex music, but if you have a very um, rigorous approach to it, um, where you've thought through everything and it's super intentional, why something is there and why something stays in there, um, then you're in good shape. So I'm going to show how I stay organized. Um, so this, oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, I sketch everything out on paper. <laughs> and so, um, so if I'm looking at a cue and I'll speak about film scoring uh, in this kind of situation, if I am scoring a scene, um, usually what I do is I, I, I got it in, I have the picture in my DAW and I, and I get a sense of whatever the tempo or the pace of the scene is. And then I just, you know, I'm usually just sort of snapping my fingers to picture and, and getting a sense of what feels pretty good to me. Then within the DAW, I find, figure out what tempo that is. And then I sort of map out that tempo. And um, let's say my theme's in 4-4. Four, four. There may be moments where I've got to either shorten or lengthen a phrase. It may not be all four bar phrases or eight bar phrases. It might be like, it's literally a seven bar phrase, but that seventh bar is a five, four bar. Mm -hmm. And, and so in order to stay within tempo uh, without doing a variable tempo where I'm starting to change things too much. Um, and, and then I just sort of map out a roadmap on my sketch paper of like how many bars where the phrases are um if i do any sort of variable tempos like if i do an acceleration to a new tempo any of those kinds of things that's that's all sort of in the sketch and and then it's literally once you've you know especially if you're working on a big projects like film or television if you know what your theme is and you know generally how you're developing your theme because you worked on the main title and maybe the end credit piece and you have a good idea of uh, tone wise what you're going to do it's literally just technical work 
Mm -hmm. I mean, there's craft to it, but it's literally technical work in how to work the theme so it works with the dialogue scene or how to work the theme in a big adventure set piece uh, action kind of a scene. Um, so, so for me, that methodology of writing it out on paper, that just works for me you know, to write a sketch and just sort of sketch out. And it's generally, it's a nine stage sketch pad, but I, um, I write really complete sketches where the whole orchestration is in the sketch. Um, and I sort of work all that stuff out before I even plug anything into the DAW. And then for the DAW, it's just, I just use it to render my audio and do a great sounding mock-up and then play that for the client. But it's, it's literally organized there on paper. That is, uh, that is fantastic and uh, it allows you to, because DAW offers a lot of things, but also limitations uh, because, you know, you can't, you can't think out the box sometimes when you're looking at a, at a screen. And this is very aligned with, uh, with what Car Carl Ritlund Masterclass is going to talk about, just the, the part of creating that sketch, uh, where it's like how, yeah, he, what, what he uses is got a page with his own design and uh, there are notes in there but but most of all he he plans the intensity and kind of like the orchestration with, without the notes in there and he can plan an entire score like the 60 minutes or the 90 minutes or um he's not doing a musical uh, the entire thing within one page of paper that's at the macro level and then the same thing in each one of the cues on paper first and yeah. I think that's so valuable because it's um in terms of a structure structure is everything sometimes and uh Sometimes you can't think structurally when you're looking at the screen and MIDI regions and all that, and having it on paper is so valuable. Yeah, and the, and I, I don't want to uh, be um, uh, exclusive in the way I think about this stuff because you know for me that's what works for me, and uh, you could be a composer who you just buy five monitors and you set up this like grid of monitors in front of you and then sort of spread out, you know, spread out your DAW so that your mix windows in one monitor, your, uh, your track windows in another, then you might have your notes in another window. You might have, uh, you know, uh, Dorco or Sibelius up in another. Cause I have, you know, some of the students that I've, I've worked with a lot of times the way they work is they'll work in Sibelius or they'll work in Dorico and they'll write their piece there. And then they'll have that up when they're playing into the DAW. And so they're using a blend of notation and, um, you know, and it's usually sometimes the multi-screen approach can help. For me, one of the things I like about paper is I can move it within a three-dimensional space on my desk. And my desk is very messy. But outside of that, it's, it's a three-dimensional space. And it's hard for me to get my head around a three-dimensional space uh, you know, the multiple monitor uh, approach might be a solution for that, where you, you're kind of moving things in, in, a, in a bigger range. Uh, and then you have certain locations where uh, you can look something up really quickly and it's like, oh, the, the monitor to my right, you know, is my, um, uh, all my samples. <laughs> and, you know, so if I want to look up and open up a sampled instrument, make a tweak or, you know, on that, you know, that's over here to the right. And then over on the left is my notation software. And, uh, or there's just, you know, uh, if you're on a Mac, text edit is open and I've just made some notes to myself to remind myself of stuff I want to do. Uh, to kind of go a little further on, on that idea of orchestrating before you render, um, and, and what you were describing uh, with the other composer as far as how they kind of create a roadmap is, I think it's, you know, you could, you could sequence within your DAW, just a piano, like a guide track that is your mm -hmm. theme and maybe some accompaniment ideas, but it could just be like a temporary piano track. That's sort of like your sketch, you know, without using notation at all, you could sketch everything out on a sketch piano track or a couple of sketch piano tracks. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when it's winter time, my voice gets a little like stuffy. Um, <laughs> so, um, so you could, you could sketch, uh, within, um, the DAW by just doing a piano sketch tracks and then, um, and then you make notes to yourself, you know, along the timeline of the sketch tracks of, 
the sort of orchestration ideas you have. So you might say in bar 78, that's the high point and that's going to be full 2D orchestration. Um, there might be dialogue in bars uh, 16 through 22, and then you just oh, dialogue, and then you might have notes to yourself like uh, just violins and a flute melody. And, you know, even though it's a piano sketch, you know, you can sort of block out what you want to do and stay organized that way. And then it makes rendering in the DAW less experimental. Uh, exactly. Because, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with things being experimental to try things out, but it can be, you know, one of the biggest problems we have as composers, and Mark, I'm sure you've run into this, is, is managing time and um, staying on schedule. And, and one of the things that we're always fighting with is how can we improve our workflow and how can we make things, um, uh, how can we do things quickly and still make it sound awesome? And, and and that's those sort of workflow issues. If there's something where I'm doing six mouse moves to do a particular function like quantizing, you know, exactly. that I might do all the time or, or lengthening notes, like a classic one for me is lengthening notes because there's some legato patches, so legato samples that <clears throat> you have to make the lengths a particular way to trigger the legato function, right? So in Cubase, I just set up a, a, a control, a key command kind of a setup where I just hit the letter L and whatever my quantized uh, setting is within, you know, within Cubase, um, whether it's eighth notes or quarter notes, I just hit the letter L and that's the right length. So that I, you know, so, so all I do is select what I want to do, hit L, boom. And, and then I can kind of keep moving forward where I'd be dragging the tails of all, all the piano grid, uh, the piano. Takes all 10, 10 times more time. Yeah. yeah, what you just said, staying on a schedule, I think it's one of the most important things for a composer. We think it's the art and the music, but um, at the end of the day, it's a business. We are running a business and you delivering on your promises and what you've said is what's going to take you farther, in my opinion, my humble opinion here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and those macros and those key switch, and those, all these things yeah. are the things that partially and also your uh, your personal power and your capacity to, to, to deliver what you've promised. Um, is what's gonna is what's gonna get you there, and you're gonna receive the next call. So th th those yeah. things are, are are very important. It seems that we are talking about, you know, you know, small things, but it is super important. And also, then when you are on track and working and working fast, what you were talking about the how do you stay organized on the sequencer? It's also very important because now it's when you are crafting the music and if you don't have a system to stay organized then you're not going to be able to express what you want to express musically and it's uh it's it's so important to me to meet something in between the the improvising or experimenting in the sequencer and the writing everything on paper first my my, my process is i have my my uh staff here to 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 write the or, or like a harmonic spot everything that 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 is hard to to do in the sequencer, I'll do it on paper, a uh, complex harmonic passage and a specific melody, th so something like this. And then what I have is at, at the top of the template, they have a series of what I call fast action patches or sketching patches. And I've got five pianos. So it's the same piano with five, five times MIDI separated. And then I've got like a full orchestra, short notes, full orchestra, long notes. Um, it's just a stack of patches. And right. then I've got the, the full brass, full, like the, the ensemble things. And then I've got big hits and things like this where I can either just do the piano sketch or, or try a few more casual things and just fast action patches. And then on top of that, I take notes with, uh, with markers and that gives me sort of like the start point. And then it just craft, start orchestrating yeah. the, the, the thing. Yeah. And I, yeah, one of the things I want to be a little cautious about <clears throat> is we're, we're talking about a lot of technical things that have very little to do with the creative aspect of it, <clears throat> you would think. Um, but uh, if being organized is actually one of the things that helps me with the creative flow of things, because <clears throat> if I'm wasting time trying to figure out how to lengthen all my notes so the legato thing triggers, <laughs> it's like, I want those, I want that time back. I, you know, it's just like, that's just so much of my life is spent doing minuscule technical things, tweaks to get the demo to sound good so that I can play it for my client and get an approval or that if, if the demo and I'm doing everything in the box, that may be the final product, you know, so, so the technical craft 
and staying organized and all these things that we've been talking about so far, they're all super helpful in order to get the job done. Um, but the inspiration part of uh, composition for me is is equally important. And, it, you know, like for me, the uh, dealing with these sort of technical issues means I have more time to think intuitively and, and work within a DAW intuitively. If I'm, if I'm not sitting there having to stop the flow of the creative thing that I'm doing because I got to go draw things and, you know, because it's not sounding right on the sample and it's bugging me, you know, if I'm not doing that, you know, then, and I think that's where the sketching process, whether it's within the DAW or on paper or wherever, uh, within notation software, the sketching process I think is great for that because then you can just be creative, you can play. Um, and it doesn't matter what sound you have when you're sketching, you can have like a cool synth sound and you're, you're inspired by how, the tone of that really is making you write a particular way. Um, and you could, you could just use that and do a sketch of that and then, um, and then take it from there, but it's not slowing you down in the same way that, you know, a, a particular sample library is being annoying, you know, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of things. Um, so I just, I just want to point out that, you know, like we're talking about a lot of technical things like spreadsheets and, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but it, but it really comes down to like, uh, you know, like all this stuff is so that you can kind of be intuitive and be in the flow of the creative space and do what you have to do. No, those, are, those things are, are, are very important. And it can, it can seem very boring, especially when we edit this, uh, we'll add some like a screen captures and thing to show some of the things. Cause sometimes it's a little bit abstract, uh, but the editors will do a, a good job. Um, and, yeah, and Actually, there's one thing that I can do here. So um, uh, let me see if I've got it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a particular piece of music that's from a game. Uh, let's see. There we go. Share screen. All right. So this is my sketch. So this was from um, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. I wrote one battle cue for the composer Gordy Hobb, uh, he got busy. They needed to write a bunch of extra music and they had a short time around. So he had written pretty much most of the score. And then for that last half hour of extra music that got sprung on him a little later, he said, hey man, are you busy? <laughs> and then had me write something. So, <clears throat> so basically this is split. Uh, woodwinds, brass strings. I kind of fit my piano harp percussion. So you can see this is my harp rip right here, this little squiggly line, you know, E7 flat nine, uh, A harmonic minor, uh, in case you can't read my writing. Um, so, you know, so there's an example, the woodwinds are copying the high strings, uh, the low woodwinds are copying the basses, I've got a brass hit, and this is just a four bar intro. Um, this number 73, 74 means whatever I wrote in bar 73 and 74, I'm gonna copy that material and use it, uh, use it here. Uh, and then this is my string. So it's sort of like cellos and basses here, uh, violins and violas here. Uh, and I just used the sketch to kind of, um, uh, kind of scroll through. So basically it's a four bar intro and then I've got the woodwinds and xylophone ripping up on a little scalar thing to a hit point. Um, this is my note to myself of what the five timpani tunings are going to be. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, page three here is the beginning of what is the loop section. Um, and then I just, you know, uh, you know, just cranking along, you know. Uh, can, but you can, can, we stop, can we stop for a second and talk about the, uh, the, the, the structure? Because you said there's an intro and that is something that they're, they're going to split into chunks, right? There's going to be an intro yes. in, the, yeah. in the engine. So and I'll, play, I'll, I'll show you this example in Weiss as well. So you can kind of see. Oh, the that's amazing. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. cool. So, yeah, so so then this is the loop thing, and then you can see my orchestration. So it's like you know, here's the solo and the French horns, here's the trumpets, um, uh, trombones are down here. Uh, you know, so it's it's super complete. I want the piano right hand of the piano to be following along with the high strings. You know, so you can see the orchestration is is very much uh, uh, complete in the sketch. Let me ask you a question. Do you, yes, go do ahead. You think you, do you think you could 
orchestrate at the same level if you were to write all this directly into the sequencer. No. Exactly. <laughs> but that's exactly. the reason I say that. Me, ne me neither. Me neither. That's, yeah. I think that's the value of writing things on paper. Sometimes you need to write and see you're not writing every like you're writing everything but how fast like you, you can write all this very fast because you are doing annotations and you know what's with uh, what's called strings and things like this um, and i think it's how you're to write wired notes. yeah i think it's how you're wired in your brain right so for me um it's a blend of audio um, intelligence and visual intelligence for me, as far as how I work best. And so I have to, I hear it in my head, like it's a radio, you know, I hear the orchestra stuff in my head. So my ear training is really good for that. Um, but seeing it on paper tells me what's correct. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I work. Some people have better, have less visual kinds of way of staying on top of things. And they're more completely through their ears or even tactile through their fingers. So if they're playing their piano, they know what it's right when it sits in their hands a particular way. And, or they know it, you know, when they hear it, they're like, that's correct. You know, that's what I want. You know, so however anybody keeps track, uh, whatever method works for any individual, because uh, everyone's a little different, um, you know, that's that's for them. For The reason I go, no, I couldn't stay organized is because this is how I do it. This is how, uh, how I, I uh, stay on top of things. Um, you know, and then on top of that, so it's got the whole loop point. And then, um, let's see, where is it? <clears throat> um, it's a longer piece. So there it is. So that's the, this is my little mark saying it's the end of the loop. And, you know, uh, and then there's like two endings. So this is my lose ending and then a win ending here. Right. So, <clears throat> so those, so basically for what we're going to show next within wise is there's four chunks. There's an intro that's four bars long that leads right into the beginning of the loop. And then there's a loop that's got some length to it of a couple of minutes long. And then there is, um, a win ending and a lose ending. Uh, so now if I flip over to Weiss. And maybe uh, you want to activate the, the original audio. That is uh, true. I think I got to do the stop share. Uh, original yeah. on and then share screen and again. Then you yes. And wa watch your echo. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, so now we're in Weiss. Uh, audio Kinetic is the company that makes Weiss. It's an audio middleware tool uh, that uh, allows us to work in a pretty robust way. So for those of you that's seen any sort of DAW thing, here's your waveform. This is my intro audio. Um, basically it looks like I've set it up as a, uh, like a one beat pickup, which allows for people to take a breath in an or This is a full orchestra uh, recording. So it allows people to take a breath and there's something about feeling that before a piece of music starts that, that feels really good. Even if you're playing a game, you know, if I trimmed it really tight to where this green flag is, which would be the beginning of this segment, that's, um, that would work fine, I suppose, but I kind of like the breath. That's just me. Um, so basically this is a, it's a four bar thing. It, it, it doesn't really show the bar count correctly because I don't have it synchronized to time. I've just actually moved this, so, uh, just so the the people watching this know what this means. So this green flag is an entry cue point. The red flag is an exit cue point. And the idea of this, and I'm going to talk more of that horizontal thing that I mentioned earlier. So the green flag is like when the game triggers, now start the intro of music. And the exit flag, this exit cue point tells me when I move on to the next thing horizontally. And so the exit cue red flag now is the same location as in my loop, my green flag right here. And in the context of Weiss, the execute flag on the looping section, the green flag, red flag thing, the entry and execute points are now my loop start and end points, right? So it works on this um, uh, horizontal level. Go ahead and ask your question. 
Thank you. So in the, the, there's there's some of the tail at the end of that, that red flag, 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 and then when yes. back, you see that they showed us to, to take that, that tail and put it at the beginning of the loop, so it loops yes. naturally. Is that yes. I guess, I guess that's something that's built into the to this loop part. part. Yeah, Weiss will automatically create a nice smooth loop. Um, mm -hmm. It sort of does this for you. But um, if you're using a horizontal system, and I'll use the intro as an example, and I'll just play this. So you've got this nice reverb tail on that, that hit point. So the way this will work, and I'm going to go up a step to the playlist container. So this is called the music segment container, so it shows the actual waveform audio. And then if I go to the playlist container, I can tell it how I want things to play. And in this case, you see, uh, and it plays things in an order, like from top down. So this top one here is where my intro is. So it's going to play that first, and then after it gets done playing the intro, then it's going to go to the next step, which is to play the loop. And then I've got it set over here to loop infinitely, right? And you're going to hear this overlap, and you'll see a little yellow arrow pointing to the thing that's playing in a given moment. So when I play the intro, or play this playlist, it's going to play the intro, and then it's going to play the loop. All right. So you now hear a seamless connection between that little rip with the woodwinds and xylophone, but yeah, the reverb tail of that blends with the beginning of the loop point. And now it sounds perfectly seamless. Um, and wow, wow, yeah. that's where the tail helps, <laughs> right? In the sort of horizontal system of play this thing first and then play the next thing. You know, it, it allows things to connect together. Um, the, uh, the win and the lose are separate and they're similar to my intro. I've got my, you know, start point, the end point, there's a tail, but this would be the lose statement. And this would be the win statement. It's so amazing. It's pretty fun. Um, yeah, it's fun. Like, you know, the Star Wars The Old Republic game that I'd worked on a bunch of years ago, that's when I first met Gordy. And uh, to, to get asked to do something in the Star Wars universe again it was so much fun. So now here's the, the next idea. I want to be able to... Um, so this is a horizontal system and there's no vertical layers or anything like that. So it's pretty simple. I'm just creating stereo files. And so I've got an intro, I've got a loop, I've got a win and I've got a lose. And then up here above this playlist container, there's what we call a switch container and a switch container within wise allows you to switch between playlists or, uh, switch between music segments and um, I'm using a particular set of transition rules. So basically, um, I've got like three simple rules here. And this is how we think about how music plays in a game. We sort of set up a system of rules of how it behaves. So right now, um, just to make it, uh, this is probably a brain melt for a lot of folks. <laughs> but so this column is the source music. The destination music is in this column, and as you can tell, my destination I write going anywhere. You know? mm -hmm. so, but you can assign it to a particular music segment or a particular playlist or anything like that. So right now I've got this playlist, which is my, uh, my playlist that plays the intro followed by the loop. So when that's the source, if I'm going anywhere, it basically says exit the source material immediately Continue playing the source materials this play post exit, and then there's a little fade out of about a half a second right here, so that it's gonna kind of like a fader move, pull out this source material and then go to the next the next destination event. Can you, Can you explain, explain in like, like down to earth words what, what because, because 
what happens, happens when, when you are done configuring, configuring all this? I guess, I guess you hit export and then this software creates a file that works with Unity Engine or whatever engine, right? Right. And, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so part of it is it, it, it's it's a little more it's a mil, it's 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 tricky to kind of get into a, as simple of an explanation as possible. But basically, um, uh, so this is um, this is a general all around kind of combat piece of music. And if you played Star Wars Battlefront two, if you play the training level at the beginning of the game, this music is one of the pieces that shows up. So it's it's an easy way to kind of see it in the game. Um, or just go to YouTube and, and uh, you look up a, a, like a walkthrough of Star Wars Battlefront 2 and it's in the beginning, uh, the first five, you know, 10 minutes of the gameplay. Um, but as far as how this works is um, you can, uh, for interactive music, basically there's what we call a work unit and the work unit is where all of the audio assets live. And you can import your audio into these work units, and you can import it either as a music segment um, or a music track. There's a couple of different ways to go. If you're doing a vertical system, music track is, is a way to go. But you can import it a couple of different ways is sort of a simpler way of saying it. Um, once you import it, then you can tell it a set of basic rules. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll use a uh, a different one in a couple of minutes to show you another example um, that's more tempo generated. But you can tell it, you know, like in s- terms of the playlist here, if I look at my general settings, um, I'm sorry, my switch container, uh, notice that my I've got a tempo of 120 beats a minute at a time, signature of 4-4. And these settings are everywhere. So they're in the music switch container, they're in the playlist here, this one's disabled. And they're in the music segments. This is also disabled. So if you have something that's 120 beats a minute and 4-4, four, four, you know, it, what it does is it lines up your bars and beats when you import your audio. And it makes it easier to kind of work with. Um, so you import your audio, and then you set up some basic rules uh, as far as working with things. And then these little flags, they're movable. So you can, you can slide them around and move them into whatever position you can say. So when does my music start? When does my music end for each little bit? And then you can set up more rules on the playlist of what order do you want things to play? So this is a simple one. This is like play the intro and then play the loop and then keep looping. So that's, that's what that playlist does. That's all it does. Play the intro and then play a loop and keep repeating. And then um, the switch container does a couple other rules, which is these transitions here, where it's like, um, you know, uh, down here you can set up, and this is how it works in the game, you set up uh, a series of game synchronization points or game states, which Mark, you might remember from the game audio class. So game state is sort of a game condition. So like, and in this case, I've got three. Combat. We're in combat. That's the game condition. And then if you lose the combat, it's combat underscore lose. That's the game state. If you win the combat, it's combat underscore win. And so, uh, and in the context of a, a game like Star Wars Battlefront, um, the lose would probably mean you die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so the kind of music that you would hear, you wouldn't hear a very specific piece of death music. You would just every time you lose a combat situation, you would uh, get the combat lose material, and then there'd be some respawn, and then you'd be back in the game. Uh, so in this particular piece, uh, the the combat, combat lose that could, happen, could happen, abruptly. happen abruptly. Does it always happen, oh, yes. happen at the end of the piece, or, or can, can it happen, happen at the middle, middle of the loop? So uh, so that's this first rule, where I go from the source material of the combat looping music to any destination, and I tell it to exit it immediately, because what I want is I want it immediately, if we win or lose in the game, we get immediate feedback of this lose piece of music. I'll play this so you can kind of hear what it does. But basically, it's um, this one rule, this one ID number two, that I've highlighted 
That's the one rule that runs this whole thing with the wins and the loses. It plays the loop, um, and then it, uh, when I'm in the combat game state, it's going to play down here. You notice the combat game state points to the playlist that plays the intro followed by the combat loop. If I have combat lose, as a game state, it plays the music segment called combat lose. And if I have combat win, as a game state, it plays a specific segment, which is combat win. So, so those are the rules of what gets played based on what game state. And then the only other thing is I have that little transition thing up here that tells me exit my, my looping thing immediately, do a quick fade out of that material, and then start the next thing immediately. Right. And um, um, before, before you, you play, play this, this yes. as, as a composer, because it's how do you deal with uh, this? This uh, this outro is gonna is gonna appear abruptly, and how do you prepare your music so you can have the outro appearing and not feeling uh, too abrupt? And that's so because because as a as a composer sometimes I may think like oh how am I gonna do this? But then you think Stravinsky and uh, there were cha abrupt changes and it just works, yes. right? So sometimes it's maybe not that big of a deal. It, yeah, it depends on what you write, uh, number one. And, and uh, number two, it depends on uh, like what you decide is the way to organize it within a tool likewise uh, or in the music implementation side of it. So I'll give a couple examples. On the creative side, um, uh, if I want it to change immediately like I'm doing in this case, um, there's a couple ways to go about it. One is I could just write it where it hits really hard right at the beginning of the win or lose and, and see if it feels okay. So some of it's an experiment. If it doesn't feel okay, I might change the rule here to go from immediate to uh, go to the next thing on the, on the next beat. And when I can set, like I had in the general settings here, I can set a tempo. It knows how what the tempo is, so it knows when the next beat is. It knows when the next measure is, and I can set up rules on my transitions to exit, you know, on the next bar, or the next beat, or custom cues. In this case, it's immediate. Um, so that's a way of organizing it. The other way is to create little transitional things to lead into, you know, the endings. So it could be a rip. It could just be like, blah, yeah, you know, something that's sort of a, it's not a hard change, but sort of a softer way to get into the next segment, you know. So I might do something creatively like that, where I just have some sort of a transitional idea that's, you know, something like a French horn rip, you know, that's just like, rip, you know, it's and just, for you know, this style in particular, particular, it would yeah. work perfectly, right? right? Yeah, and that might be enough to kind of glue everything together. So in the context of what we've got here, you know, and I don't know if this is gonna work perfectly because it's been a while since I played this particular thing, but I'm basically, so the switch container right here under game states on my transport control, I'm gonna say, hey, we're in combat and then hit play. That's our intro. Beginning of the loop. I'm gonna hit the win. Right? I can not tell. Like it's it's like a, it's like it's like a seven eight bar, like an eighth note. It just sort of happened to be that. Right? Exactly. So now if I go back to combat and I hit the lose. So it is immediate, it is abrupt in that case, but, but, it, it, but it just works. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, so, and I guess when but you're I can, playing, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's, it's even, even less big of a deal. Yeah. So if you're playing, that may feel completely fine. It may feel a little awkward. And if so, you know, the beautiful thing is I can change this to whatever I want it to be, right? So um, I'm going to use another project. Um, 
Uh, so this I'll is. Um, okay. Go ahead. No, uh, I'll, just, I'll show you the recording of all these in case there's any name or anything that we can show. We we can hide and edit it. Yeah. So for for that first example, that was from that was a combat cue from Star Wars Battlefront Two, mm -hmm. and this is from I was asked to do um, uh, Dota Two, which is um, Valve. It's their esports title. Mm -hmm. um, Dota Two has the uh, kind of, I suppose you could say yeah. So that's their esports title, and. Um, they do international competitions every year, and usually they ask a guest composer to write about 20 minutes of material uh, that is specifically for those events. And so they had asked me to do a score for them. Uh, so this is, and this isn't a, like uh, just so that your viewers know, uh, we didn't use WISE as far as implementing into Dota 2. They have their own internal audio. Uh, proprietary audio uh, engine that they use so they did all the implementation on their end this is me being nerdy and mm -hmm. and just creating a music system within wise that simulates what it would do in the game to you test, know. Right? yeah just to test out and to kind of and and also just because i'm a nerd i just yeah i was having fun by doing this right if so if, if they don't have wise um, um, I remember, remember back at UC, you use Ableton Live, Live to test all these things. Yeah. yeah, you could totally use Ableton Live and just set up in that sort of, you know, the main window. You could set up little triggering points and stuff like that. It's like trigger the intro. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do with the Ableton Live to kind of simulate things. Um, but uh, like FMOD is another middleware tool. FMOD and WISE, I think, are both free to use. They have some limitations. Um, Weiss's limitation is that you can only have 200 audio assets in a particular session um, and if you overdo it it won't let you save or something like that um, mm -hmm. but 200 audio assets is quite a bit so you can do pretty good stuff with um, with just you know a, the free version and it's a fully functioning version it just has a particular uh, limit as far as how many assets you can have in, in in the uh, uh, in the session. That's all. But you know, so it's easy to download for free. It's easy if anybody really wants to get into it, learning like FMOD or Wise. Wise has a certification program. It's it's basically free to take the course material. It doesn't cost anything. If you want to be officially certified, I'm 101 and 201 certified in Wise. Um, it costs a couple hundred bucks to do the the test for the certification. Um, and they have to get like 90% or something like that on the test. Um, but the uh, learning it, you don't have to pay anything. You can just learn it and, um, and get an idea of how things work and, and how to implement things. So, you know, and just have fun experimenting around. Um, so, so there's a lot of stuff, a lot of playlists, a lot of music segments in this setup. And if I go to my, my master switch container here, if I look at my list of game states, you'll see, like right here. Oops, not big enough. There we go. So, so you know, this is the esports title. So you play as the Dyer or the Radiant. So one of the two sides. And then there's a bunch of game events like, you know, the ancient monolith that you have to destroy is how you win a match. So if you destroy, if if um, if if you're uh, if you destroy the ancient on the dire side, it, that's one game event. If it's radiant side, uh, and then all the little switches like if you're going back to the pregame area, uh, if the battle uh, condition is ended, if there's a battle intensity game state, if you're ganked, that's a game state. Um, hero selection if you're killed. There's a laning intensity. There's ready to play. There's a respawn. There's a Roshan, which is a mo uh, like a, a boss level monster, and there's a smoke feature, and then there's the user interface startup kind of thing. So there's all these little game states, and at the bottom you'll see, um, oops, wrong way. Down here you'll see, for each of these game states, it 
picks a particular music segment or playlist, right? So that's similar to what I showed you before. It's just bigger now. So we've upped the scope of things. And, and then to up the scope even further, there's more rules. So I've got different kinds of things for different setups. I don't have to get into a ton of detail, but like one of the things that was really tricky was um, uh, on the battle music, they wanted a very specific ending for each individual battle cue, but they wanted to randomly pick any of the band battle cues. So the puzzle <laughs> for me, which took me a while to figure out one day, was if it plays battle one, and the game condition is battle ends, right? I'm telling it to go and play a very specific, the battle one ending, right? So I can be that crazy specific. So it's the same for battle two and battle three. It's just, it mm -hmm. plays the very specific ending when the game state is battle end, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, so you can do crazy stuff like that. Just to give you an idea, I'll just play... And then most of the transitions are set up. You can see if I click on each one, next This bar. is crazy, yeah, and there's, there's, it's, it's very complex, complex, but we're yeah. still yeah. having... Uh, we're not even talking, talking about vertical, vertical right? right? So, so far, it's just horizontal. horizontal. Well, yeah, so this is, you know, on the... on the, the, the switch container is more of a horizontal way of changing. With game states, it plays a particular piece of music. So that is the horizontal component. I will definitely show the vertical, too. Um, so, but just to give an idea on the horizontal side, it on the, on the UI startup when it goes to anything else, it's going to do it on the next bar. On the preparation phase, going to anything else, it's doing it on the next beat. So I'm changing things based on how it feels good to me. Uh, so you can control all that stuff. So let's get into very specific things. So most of this stuff is um, a single stereo file. Um, so the countdown stereo file, the battle music stereo file. When we get down to the laning music, that's when we get vertical. So all this stuff is, um, and you can see, you know, I'm doing the same thing, start and end points um, for all, all of these different cues. When I get down to laning, <coughs> uh, so there's three different cues that are what, or what are the laning cues. And if, if you've ever played Dota 2, what laning is, is um, there's sort of three lanes that you can travel in, in. So basically there's, imagine my screen is the whole map. So if I'm starting here in my enemy um, uh, ancient tower that I got to destroy is on the opposite side. So there's a lane that goes up the center and then there's two lanes that circle around off the sides. You know, and I can pick any of those lanes. So when I'm in laning mode, which is the general thing that you're in when you're trying to get your troops across to the other side, it's going to play the laning material. And I've got it set up where there's three layers. There is, um, and I'll just play this first cue, and I'm going to mute, um, or actually I'll just solo. Uh, so layer one is the basic layer. If I hit play. Layer two is some percussion. And layer three is, in this case, brass. So you can hear everything. It all works together. But, um, and I, I know, because uh, you mentioned this earlier, Mark, uh, like in um, uh, in the game audio class, I was like, don't just do the brass. <laughs> That's a separate <laughs> thing. Um, uh, so, uh, so I'm calling myself out on this. Uh, uh, in, this in this case, it was, this is like, this was one way that made the most sense in this game. So, so the caveat to that particular rule, what I was trying to do for, for you and for the other students is don't just think one dimensionally. You know, it could be that 
you know, like I could break things out where I have some percussion on layer two. That's a kind of medium intensity feeling. Mm -hmm. And then I might save some of my deep, big drums to add to the brass in layer three. Um, the other reason that I did the brass in this particular one is um, the some of the percussion and the, the string quartet that's in here is in layer one. Then I have other percussion in layer two. And then the brass is just sampled brass. So everything else is real people. Um, so it just happened to be a way for me to kind of put the brass in in an interesting way. Um, so part of it is you're making creative decisions as to far as how you can do stuff. If I wanted to be super fancy, I, and especially because it samples, uh, I could split my brass up where like I could have two layers of brass. One mm -hmm. is like medium layer, one would be you know, for layer two, one would be layer three. And um, I might have a simpler version of this brass idea where I break off, like maybe downbeats are going to be in layer two, and then all the other stuff is going to be in layer three. So you could go crazy and do, and and break things out that way. I, um, I guess it's, it's not, not the, the yeah. it's what, what the, the instruments, instruments or the sections, sections are, are doing. It's uh, uh, or separating by sections. sections. It's it's, it's what the, uh, what's the meaning the musically or yeah emotionally. How does it feel? Doing. Yeah, exactly. totally. to, to me, music I got yeah, these like, like three layers. layers. It's uh, direction, movement, and background. Sure. Just the, the way, way of saying things. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, a lot of times you get held adding, adding intensity. intensity. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, this is more of a intensity. And then on top of that, and just to see how this works. Um, so this little orange thing right here, um, that means I've added a real-time parameter control. And it has to do with the volume. So it's like a fader move. And it's, uh, it's based on a game state called music intensity level. Mm -hmm. And right now I've got my music intensity set all the way up so you hear everything. But if I, um, if I play, so now I have nothing soloed. If I play with the music intensity down, so it's like a zero to 100 kind of thing as far as lowest intensity is zero, highest intensity is 100. And notice how uh, layer two, it kind of kicks in around 25 and ramps up easily up to 75 and then layer three it starts at 50 and goes all the way up to 100 right mm -hmm. so now if i play this and I'll, I'll focus on layer two so you can kind of see and i'll mute layer three um this is just layer one So there's a vertical system where you're using, you know, volume control, uh, and then you just set up rules on your volume control on how. And, those and layer two has, has the music intensity fading in from, from like, like 20, 20 to 50, 50 and, and the brass from, from 50, 50 to 100, right? right? Yeah, and those are arbitrary numbers. It depends on what you know. It, it might be something you work out with the game developer as far as like what the rules are going to be of what they consider a medium intensity or high intensity situation. Um, it could not be like zero to 100. It could be like one to five. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be like a five is like a lot of enemies and, and one is no, or like one enemy. And, you know, like somewhere in the middle, like a two or a three is like a couple, you know, like, you know, three or four enemies, that kind of a thing. So, so a lot of times those are discussions that you have with the game developer in figuring out what, um, uh, what's the smart way to go. And, and, and so, so yeah, so then you can set those sort of values. Uh, and it's literally you just, you know, double click and add a value. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's super easy to draw in. And you can even be specific. Like I have, if I select this one value, I can type in very specific numbers so I can be very exact. Uh, so it's, you know, you know so that's, that's an example of a, uh, like a vertical system. And then this will just keep playing uh, the way this works is um, 
with the laning material is there's three pieces of material that I wrote and then it randomly picks one and it plays it and it just keeps playing as long as you're in the laning section it's going to keep playing laning music so if it plays laning number one first time as soon as it's done doing that it's going to roll the dice and pick another one um, and the only thing it does is it tells it don't the avoid repeat one means mm -hmm. um, don't play the last thing you just played <laughs> so if it plays number one it's not going to play number one again it'll play either two or three and then after let's say it picks three after it's done playing three it won't play three again it'll pick one or two and then just kind of keep rotating through this little group of choices um, and it could be super interesting where it'll it'll just play uh, similar material over um, a long period of time if you're 10 minutes in the lanes which is a very I mean usually these these sort of esports things they don't last that long <laughs> It's they go really quickly because those players are really great. But mm -hmm. you know, so there, there's there's a couple of visual examples of uh, of like how things work both vertically and horizontally. That is and fantastic. Hopefully, people's brains aren't too melted down. You know, it's it's don't worry about that. More, it's just trying to get everybody to think about what are ways that I can create really interesting music and how can I break it into little pieces. Um, I'll give you uh, some examples are like with a vertical system uh, uh, like one example is um, let's say you have a vertical system where different things come in depending on how many quests you solve you know versus t intensity layers you know yeah. so that's so that's an example of you know like uh, what are the game conditions that create different vertical elements uh, one is like, let's say you're winning the battle and you have your heroic theme stuff on a separate layer. And if you're losing the battle, maybe it plays uh, I'm in trouble theme kind of a thing. So, so, so it doesn't necessarily matter what the game condition is with vertical systems. Uh, the most common one is intensity. Because uh, usually a lot of games, um, whether it's you know first person shooter uh, or an esports title, the intensity has to do with how stressed do I feel when I'm in, in a sort of a combat situation? Uh, or if it's a game like The Last of Us, there's probably some stress level of, hey, there's zombies. So, <laughs> so you know, like, you know, you just get all stressed out. You don't want to die. Uh, so the fear levels and things like that. So in that's, that case, that's it, a lot of it. Can you turn off the, uh, the original audio? Yes. So in that, thank you. So, so in that case, all of the three segments are synced because it's intense at the end. It, there's a, like a fade in, fade out. Um, when it's a specific snippet of music, um, like a hit or something, a hit could be uh, easier because harmonically maybe it doesn't have to. It's sure. just a percussive hit. But what about when it's a, a specific music element that has that could happen, triggered by the engine, uh, and it still has to match with uh, what's going on harmon uh, musically in the background or yeah, I can use, uh, like, one example I've seen, like, the, some of those Crash Bandicoot games. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sort of the level music that you hear as you're playing. But then you're jumping and you're, like, bouncing up and down and hitting your head on these apple boxes. And then, you know, and there's these musical sort of, it's sound design, but it's kind of a musical sound design. And it could be that those elements are immediately playing, but they're kind of tuned to work with what the music track is. Um, one might be, that um, you time it instead of immediately triggering those elements that are like sort of one shot kinds of hit elements. Uh, it could be that you do it on a beat. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so an example would be uh, you have, um, well, like I'll give you two examples. Immediate non-timed, you're in a haunted house, it's spooky ambient music and then you step on a trap door and you can immediately hit like an orchestral stinger that's just going to go ah, something you know you just did something that you shouldn't have done which is step on the trap door and then out come the zombies so uh so that can be a hit that's triggered immediately and if your ambient looping material for we're in the spooky room is it feels kind of rubato kind of open you know that hit is going to sound completely fine and yeah. and it could be you know in the context of that haunted house kind of vibes 
it could be tonal, it could be non-tonal. Exactly. It, it, could, it could be whatever. Um, but then there might be a situation where your background track has a tempo to it. Yeah, that's where that immediate thing, and we got lucky with the Star Wars Battlefront 2 example here, but um, it could be that it feels awkward like you were describing earlier. In that case, you might want to set up a rule on the next beat, do the hit, mm -hmm. right? And then you might have custom hits for whatever track is playing so that you're within the key signature of the track that you're in. And you just set up rules like if I'm playing this track and I trigger a hit, go to this folder and only play those hits. So, oh, so you, you can set up a little nested structure that um, allows you to be very specific versus and very generalized. On the, on the creative side as a composer, I guess if you are planning this, um, there are certain, like if you're in this specific key, there are certain notes that are gonna work no matter the chord. Yeah. So, so like an extension of the chord or the, so, so I guess sometimes you don't, you have to test things, but you don't have to worry too much that, oh, I'm in F, so I can just use F, A, and no, you can, you, sometimes you can, yeah. it's more like an effect or like a reap or like a series, totally. like a melody that, that just works no matter what yeah. the chord. Yeah. So uh, you know, here's an example. Um, what would, you know, for throw a little music theory. So let's say we're in F major and uh, where I'm going to next is in B flat. Okay. And so if I know that as a composer and I'm doing something for a game, um, I know that if I'm in F major in my, my first cue, and then at any moment we can transition over to the new piece of music in B flat. If I have like a, like a little pickup measure that's got a B flat in it, that's mm -hmm. going to rub against the A natural in my F major, right? But if I pick an F, you know, as my pickup going into the B flat material, then I know that it'll work. If I pick, even if I pick the D, you know, if, I, if I'm just sticking with chord tones, if I pick the D, you know, it's going to sound like a six in, mm -hmm. in F major. In it, it might sound a little, it's not, it's not dissonant, it's somewhat consonant. It's not like a seven, <laughs> like, you know. Um, but it could even be yeah. desirable, right? Because it prepares for a change and that's what you want. Yeah, sure. here's an example. Let's say where I'm going to is B flat Lydian where there's an E natural in the scale, right? So I'm in F major, I could have a high E in the violins as my pickup measure transitional element to go to B flat and then that might be the beginning of this violin melody that starts on that sharp four on that E natural over the B flat Lydian kind of sound. And it might resolve to like E to D kind of a suspension, you know? So, so it creates this dissonance of hearing that E natural, that dissonant uh, interval relationship to F major, but it's still F major, so it'll sound okay. Um, you know, so, so there's things like that. If I'm thinking tonally, I always think about, and this is, this is one thing I tell um, my students a lot when we're coming up with game audio ideas, is it's really important when you're developing your music design and your music system as you're writing every cue is to think about where you are and where you're going. <laughs> so in the context of the Star Wars Battlefront 2 example, if I'm in the intro, where I'm going to is that first bar of the loop. So I have mm -hmm. to when I transition at the last bar of the intro material has to feel perfectly suited to go into the first bar of the loop. Now on the win and the lose, uh, you know, the trick is as far as where I am and where I'm going to is the rule will be at any given moment, I could win the battle or lose the battle from that looping thing. So maybe I stick with the general, key center. In the context of that particular cue, my loop actually, I modulate around a lot. So because I'm modulating around a lot, if I modulate to a win or a lose, the listener, the player is not going to notice so much because I've set up in the looping that, I, yeah, I modulate. So exactly. if we modulate to the win, modulate to lose, uh, it can work. 
but I'm, I do think I have to think about it. I have to think about how does that, how does that sound? And the way I test it in Cubase is like, I'll use for one set of cues, intro, loop, win, lose. It's all in one session file. And I might put four bars of rest in between each little segment. And so I'll just play through the loop material and then I'll just do a little quick transport jump to a particular mm -hmm. win or the lose. And I'll just play and I'll just experiment and trigger different things. If you're in Ableton Live, like we talked about the example before, you know, you've got your loop playing and then you just hit the play the next item on the on a on a vertical playlist, which would be a win or lose, and you could tell it to switch immediately or on the next beat in Ableton Live. And it's easy to test out. You can just play your loop and wherever in the loop you want to go, you just like trigger the lose or the win and see how that feels. And then you might realize I need a little something more to kind of make that connection a little better. So maybe you need a little pickup material like a quarter note pickup or a, a, a one measure long pickup. Uh, in the context of combat music, usually a measure long change doesn't necessarily work very well. Um, mm -hmm. unless it's a combat ending yep. in a way like, um, you know, you want it to, the combat to kind of actually feel like it takes a bar to complete. Um, and then you might have a one bar like cymbal swell or some, something, um, some synth component that kind of takes over and then leads yeah. into, uh, now we're back in exploration or something like that. So but the bees are it's... saying the same thing as yeah. well. Like you can yeah. tell it's ending. Yeah. So mm -hmm. part of it is figuring out where am I? Where am I going? And I think yeah. that is one of the most. Uh, the you, 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 you've you've shared a lot of great things. Um, one of uh, one of the nuggets is what you just heard: knowing where you are going, and that ties back with what we were saying at the beginning. That may seem boring, but it's staying organized. And because if if you know where you are going, then staying organized, you're gonna plan ahead and. And the type of music that you're going to compose when you're crafting the music, yeah. uh, if you decide correctly, you're, you're going to spend the next 12 hours composing the right thing. Yes. Uh, if you don't plan ahead and you don't know where you're going, you're going to spend 12 hours composing the wrong music that you're going to have to rewrite. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, some, in some examples, so here's, here's, here's a crazier example. Just I'll describe it more than anything else. Um, Let's say I, and uh, I'll just actually, um, let me just do it. I'm not going to play anything, so we'll just keep the uh, mm -hmm. um, cool, yeah. original audio original off. Audio. Um, so in this laning example in Dota 2, I've got three music segments, laning one, two, and three. So those are three pieces of music I wrote. And the way it plays is it if if you haven't changed the game state and you're still in the laning mode it plays through the entire segment of laning one and then it goes to the beginning of layer two or three uh, laning two or three mm -hmm. yeah so i have to make sure that this is the where am i and where am i going i have to make sure the very end of laning one makes sense with the beginnings of laning two and laning three I have to make sure the end of laning two makes sense with the beginning of laning one and laning three. And the other permutation, if I'm in laning three, when it gets to the end of laning three, it's got to make sense to go into laning one or two. And that's a complex kind of compositional puzzle to figure out where am I going. So, so sometimes it can be if I'm in F major in laning one, but I'm in D minor in laning two, but I'm in B flat major in laning three. You know, those are all diatonically related. You know, F major relative minor would be D minor, you know, going to the subdominant B flat for the music nerds. So it's, it's all, uh, those are all related. So the B flat sounds like, hey, now we're going from one to four. If I go from F major to D, oh, now we're going to the relative minor. If I'm in D minor, I think, okay, I'm in D minor and B flat would be the flat six, a very classic kind of compositional modal kind of progression is to go from one minor to flat six in D natural minor. So mm -hmm. it's super, so all those things relate. 
And I'm not going to I'm not going to do that every time I'm in F major. I'm not going to pick that particular tonality. Um, but you know, that's that's a way that I might think about where am I going to, and what makes sense. Uh, it was that's just on a harmonic level. Um, uh, on another level, my orchestration at the end of Q number one has to feel pretty good with the orchestration at the beginning of cues number two and three. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so there are like three yeah. elements. There's the, yeah. the, the key, uh, there's the orchestration, and there's the, the time, because it can be the next beat, the next bar, abruptly. So all these things you have to plan ahead. Yeah, and, and honestly, you know, you don't have to do something just to kind of not impose too many restrictions. It doesn't mean that the tempo has to be the same. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, the tempo is 80 beats a minute in number one, but maybe it's 84 in number two. It's just a little faster because in the exploration forest area that I'm describing from before, you know, it's generally about a particular pace that feels good to the way it looks in the game. So it might 80, 84 works, 72 works, you know, or, or it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be that, what I'm writing is more ambient anyway. Mm -hmm. It's more exactly. sustained. So therefore, you know, a change in tempo, you know, like if I, if I have a hold, uh, my last bar is sort of a held whole note and I change tempo, it's fine. Yes. <laughs> so, so part of it is context. Part of it is, you know, uh, you know, what's the context? You know, is the context my key signatures, you know, and the tonalities that I'm creating? Is the context the pacing of things? Is the context um, the, um, the tonal vibe or the situation? So the context, I might have three completely unique pieces of music for exploration. And they may have, I might use a little leitmotif idea where I take a theme that's similar and I might do different versions of it. It's more like development of a compositional material. I might have that bits of that theme in each of those three pieces, but it's not like, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm playing a tune and I always play that theme. It's more like it's a motif that I use to kind of help connect those three pieces together, but it could be, there could be a central theme or a melody in each of those three pieces. That's very different, but still has a similar feeling of, Hey, we're in a forest. And exactly. You know, so so what I do is that's the context. The context is we're in a forest. I'm going to have music that feels like, hey, we're in a forest. But I might also have a thematic idea that's a central theme for the whole game that I'm going to weave into all three of those little pieces to help connect those things together. Exactly makes makes complete makes complete sense uh, that when you say the when you say the the music that feels like a forest, that's the orchestration in that case. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know how to close this class because I'm so, so, so amazed and that it, it's uh, so amazing what you are, what, what you are hearing. Oh, um, thank you. But, but I think, um, I think, uh, I got a lot of value <laughs> and I think when we, yeah, and I've had so much fun. Of, yeah, I've had so much fun talking with you, Mark. It's, it's uh, great to see you. You're looking good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did my hair before the class. Yes. Oh, right. no, yay. No, thank you so much. Um, it's, uh, it's been amazing. Thanks for the 90 minutes of, of pure value. And uh, I hope the students enjoy, uh, enjoy what, sure. you, what you share with them. I'm sure they will. Yeah. All right. Great. Mark, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for, ch for checking this out. We really appreciate it.